Jerry Humphreys walking up to a microphone on the stage on the, the first night. Um, there wasn't any, sh any music scheduled on the first night of the first Sunbury, but the bands wanted to play anyway. Um, and the uh, lighting crew were in the lighting pit just in front of the stage doing what lighting crews do with um, herbal enhancement. And uh, Jerry Humphreys walked up to the was EMC, walked up to a microphone and said, oh look, they're smoking drugs in the lighting pit. <laughs> and the, the lighting crew just disappeared in every direction, <laughs> leaving me standing there. But uh, there was no policeman came chasing after us, so perhaps they just turned a, a deaf ear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Deb, why did you start the Sunbury Facebook group? Um, gee, well, I've always had fond memories, like, um, the memories just always stayed with me, and I became very passionate about it, and um, I thought about it quite often, and anyway, I thought to myself, I was just getting into Facebook and getting to know how it operated, and I thought I'd start this Facebook group. I'd love to share memories and photos and and that sort of thing, stories and experiences with other people that attended. And I'll give it a go and just see if other people want to share stories and photos. And, and it stayed at probably 30 for about three or four years, would you believe? And then it slowly started taking off. And um, like now we're nearly, what, 4,000 or? 4,200, somewhere like that. And just in the last, what, um, last month, I think it is, we've had 1,000 new members, just in the last month. And I had a look at some stats actually just yesterday, and I came up with 87,000 people have viewed our group um, because we've been, I've been sharing, and Mark's been sharing posts into other groups as well, music groups and things like that. And people will have a look at that post. And um, so we've got about, yeah, 4,200 members, but out of those views, not everybody joined the group. Anyway, um, they know it says, so hopefully people will join it. And it does grow every day. It's always growing. Uh, Adrian's a bit of a hoarder. Um, and he has, a, he has some show and tell. <laughs> uh, of course, the great thing uh, in that period was to have a T-shirt with uh, something musical on it. And I, I screen printed our own ESP light show T-shirts. Um, my sister, who was a bit of an artist, showed me how to do it. Incidentally, I had, I had two sisters, and the youngest one was allowed to go if um, I looked after her. So I said to mum, yeah, I'll look after her. <laughs> well, I went in the gate and down to the stage and she disappeared that way and I didn't see her for three days. <laughs> so I've no idea what she got up to, but she came back you know, undamaged. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was quite an exciting time. Adrian, you're sure and tell. Wow. We're all skinny little people in We're those really days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Mushroom. Of course, the uh, Mushroom Records were um, launched with the triple album, the first Australian triple album at the uh, Sunbury 73. Now, when I was... Uh, interviewed uh, by um, by Red Simons, who failed to recognise me as being the boom operator on Hey Hey It's That Day for many years. Um, but he was worried, the only thing he could think about somebody was he didn't get paid. And I felt like saying, but I didn't, but if, um, if somebody had never happened, there might have been no Mushroom Records. And if there was no Mushroom Records, what might have happened to a little band called Skyhawks. So yes, um, I think a lot of things grew out of Sunbury. It was televised by Channel 7 the first year, despite the fact that the festival 
was being run by nine. Nine weren't interested, uh, but the year later they sure were. Um, the album was a, the triple album was a, a bestseller. I think it went platinum, and I think both you gentlemen have a track on it. Yep. Yep. Possibly. Maybe yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a great time. Oh, yeah. so, ah, twelve, twelve pound toothbrush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, very good. Um, Seventy-five. Oh. The year I went. Well, they were all the same size, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I might mention that the uh, the security of the festivals was done by Bob Jones, who was doing a lot of the Melbourne dance venues in those days. And the security guys all had t-shirts, white t-shirts, with smiley faces on them, so that they wouldn't be intimidating. So there, there was, there'd been a lot of thought gone into the uh, festival from uh, John Fowler and his team. There were some really some fabulous groups at Sunbury. And another guy that recorded it all. John French. John French. Yeah. Oh. TCS. TCS was um, Television City Sound. It was part of Channel 9. Uh, they did the recording for the uh, first three Sunburys. I'm not sure if there was any recording done in 75. I certainly never heard any music, no. Um, and part of the, the resurgence in Australian music was not only in the bands that were about, in the technology that was being applied for live presentations, but there were a couple of really important recording studios, um, one of which was Bill Armstrong's, the other was TCS, and John French was the main engineer at TCS. He died, unfortunately, just as the Sunbury book was coming out, um, but he gave a lot of bands a great voice. Absolutely. John was an absolute master of his, his uh, trade and uh, he, he did both our LPs, uh, Still Point and Butterfly Farm. He invited me out to see him and take my um, album because he wanted me to sign it. Oh, good on him. Just before yeah. My only criticism of John French was when we were recording, I can't remember if it was Butterfly Farm or Still Point, but he took our herbal enhancements away from us until we'd finished recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a um, country radio live album that the only parts on the album that are original are the commentaries um, because they were all too whacked to, to uh, play properly and they had to come back and do it again without a live audience the next night. <laughs> um, Mississippi? Mark uh, James was uh, in that band and uh, he uh, alone and the people I've talked to about Queen's appearance, he alone was the guy that said, I really like this band, they're going to go far. And, and <laughs> I honestly think they were um, seriously misjudged from that uh, from that performance. I didn't see it, mind you, uh, but there was a, a lot of politicking going on. And that's what happens when something's successful. It was the same thing with Long Way to the Top. The first, the first version of that was speculative, just as this festival was speculative. 
And so everybody was prepared to take the same money, which they did. And when it became a success, then that all changed. And people had different money, um, management of course, and, and agencies had different money and they were demanding the lights. The lights were crucial to a performance. Um, and so um, managers and bands would do anything to get the lights. And I suspect either ACDC or Queen uh, were dilly-dallying so they could get the lights and caused a lot of disruption and uh, disaffection from the crowd and from the road crew in particular. So um, there's always two sides to the story, but I, I think that uh, I would trust Harvey's musical judgment and, and I think he was looking at them from an unbiased Sheffield point of view. Yes, a Deep Purple were booked to uh, play the 75 Festival. Now, um, Michael Gudinski had been in John Fowler's ear saying, we want some international acts. John's concept of the festival was that it was to be Australian music to an Australian audience on Australia Day before Australia Day gained some of the negative connotations it has now. So anyway, Queen was the first one they booked. Um, the big problem was that no one knew Queen's music. Uh, their minder had taken um, their album to Molly Meldrum, and Molly had thrown it out a second story window without listening to it. No one knew their music. Uh, they took a long time to get going, and it was only afterwards we realised that there'd been a miscalculation about daylight saving because I'd been trotted down to the stage to meet Queen um, beforehand and they, they asked them what do you want for lights and they said nothing on the screen and everything else you've got. So they were clearly waiting for it to get dark. Now normally there'd be with Adrian's crew there'd be a, a 10 to 15 minute changeover for every band but uh, Queen dilly dallied for three quarters of an hour and then Michael Chuck got up and said something that was uh, politically incorrect. Um, and of course the, the audience then who were full of beer and had been sitting in the hot sun with no music for, oh, at least half an hour, turned on the band. But I thought Queen played pretty good and uh, certainly had a fabulous front man, but no one knew the songs and I think they realised about halfway through their set and started playing uh, bit, bits and pieces of rock and roll, Joe. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, Harvey reckons he heard Freddie Mercury say, Plan B. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway, they, they, people have said they were booed off stage. They were booed, they weren't booed off stage. They finished their set, um, and Freddie Mercury's passing, uh, parting words were, uh, We'll be back, and we'll be back as the biggest band in the world. And he, he was exactly right, yeah, yeah. Their first album with Queen was billed as a New Zealand album, but again, Australia wasn't ready for it. That's what happened. Then the second album came out with that, with that cover, and that sort of um, medieval sort of... Um